to introduce the speaker for our third digital lecture, Mark Selleck. Mark has been studying for some 15 years, um, both formally and personally in the field of history. Uh, during this time, he developed a keen fascination and interest in the ancient Greek world and has made this his primary focus. He founded the podcast titled Casting Through Ancient Greece in January 2020, but had been planning it for some time, drafting written and conceptual work for over 12 months. The Casting Through Ancient Greece podcast is catered to both newcomers as well as those with an already established interest in the ancient Greek world. The series focuses on retelling the story of ancient Greece, starting with Greek prehistory and aims to travel all the way through to the Hellenistic period after the death of Alexander the Great. Mark's motivation to start this podcast was to take his interest in ancient Greek history further. He wanted to present and engage with people outside of an academic setting where his enjoyment for writing and sharing with others could really flourish. Now, just a reminder for the duration of the lecture, participants' cameras will be switched off and their audio muted so that Mark isn't accidentally interrupted uh, and to avoid digital lag. If this hasn't happened automatically, um, I'd just like to ask you to do, do so manually. Also, for anyone interested, uh, there will be time for questions at the end of the lecture. Please hold them um, and then type them into the Zoom chat which can be found at the bottom or the right of your screen, where I will read out a few uh, depending on time so that Mark can answer. I'd now like to welcome Mark to begin his lecture. All right, thank you, Miltiades. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the uh, Palaconian Brotherhood of Melbourne for having me come here and give this talk tonight. And a big thank you to Miltiades, your president, for uh, seeking me out and extending the invitation to speak here. So the topic of tonight's talk is going to be on the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, obviously, we're celebrating the fact that it happened 2,500 years ago. Now, it's not exactly known when the battle, what day the battle occurred. Um, we've got a lot of dates sort of ranging from uh, mid-August mid to early September, but the most common date that is usually ascribed is around the 20th of August, which we've just passed. Now, Thermopylae is a battle, and it happened in a larger context. And that was the Greek and Persian Wars. So I'll just bring up my slideshow here. All right, so as I said, um, Thermopylae was part of a larger conflict known as the Greek and Persian Wars. Uh, these took place or well, began around the beginning of the 5th century BC and would rage for about 50 years. Um, these were fought between uh, the independent Greek city-states and the Persian Empire. Uh, the Persian Empire at this stage was a fairly uh, new entity. It had only come into existence about 50 years um, before this under Cyrus the Great. And by the time of the Greek and Persian Wars, it was now under its third ruler, Darius I. Um, we have a number of sources, that ancient sources, that do tell us about um, the Greek and Persian Wars, uh, namely in parts through Diodorus Siculus. We have Xenophon, uh, Thucydides, Plutarch, but our most complete history of this period is through Herodotus in his histories. Uh, his primary focus was uh, retelling the Greek and Persian Wars in his works. Now, the beginning of the Greek and Persian Wars is often considered to have begun with an event known as the Ionian Revolt. And this is a revolt that broke out on the Anatolian coastline in the region of Ionia. Uh, all along the coastline here were a number of Greek city-states. These had begun as colonies that had set out from uh, the Greek mainland some, you know, 100 years earlier, um, if not more, and established, established themselves as independent city-states. Um, 
though in recent times they had been placed under control. Firstly, though, um, the Lydian Empire had incorporated into their empire, but then as the Persians started rolling across um, Anatolia, uh, they were absorbed into the Persian Empire. So these Greeks were no longer free anymore. Um, anyway, the revolt broke out in 499 BC and the leader of the revolt, Aristagoras, he sought to gain more allies to help in their, the Greeks gaining their freedom. He um, traveled across the Aegean and his first port of call was to Sparta. Now, by this stage, Sparta was considered the preeminent polis in the Greek mainland. Uh, it had a lot of influence and control in the Peloponnese. And so this was everyone's obvious uh, choice for the powerful, uh, powerful Greek city-state. Uh, he tried to convince uh, one of the kings, Sparta was ruled by, well, not ruled, but it had a dual kingship. Uh, they weren't absolute rulers. But um, he tried to convince Cleomenes to come and send troops to help him out in his revolt. Um, he put forward his arguments. Uh, eventually, Cleomenes asked him, how far march was it from the coast to Susa, which was uh, one of the Persian capitals? And to this, Aristagoras replied, it would be a three month march. And to this, Cleomenes replied, get out of Sparta. There was no way he was gonna send a Spartan army three months away from Sparta. Um, Sparta did have a slave helot population that they had to keep in check that uh, was instrumental to their economy. Anyway, Aristagoras decided his next port of call was to head to Athens. He uh, arrived in Athens and was able to convince the Athenians to support his plight. Um, I have a little quote here from Herodotus, who it seems he takes a bit of a dig at uh, democracy. But he, sa he says, um, apparently it is easier to impose upon a crowd than upon an individual. For Aristagoras, who had failed to impose upon Cleomenes, succeeded with 30,000 Athenians. Um, so Athens wasn't the only uh, city that he was able to gain aid from. He also got it from uh, Eritrea on the, off the coast on Euboea. Uh, this aid came in the form of 20 ships from Athens and five from Eritrea. They were joined together and sailed across the Aegean and arrived at Ephesus. Here they would meet uh, the Ionian force. They would march on to Sardis, which was the provincial capital in the region. Um, we hear that a fire broke out in Sardis. The Greeks failed to take the Acropolis there and decided to abandon their, their assault on Sardis. On their return march back to Ephesus, a uh, Persian force was able to catch up to them and forced a battle. Uh, the Greeks were routed during this battle and the Athenians and Eritreans packed up, hopped back on their ships and went back home and they would take no more part in the revolt. But the revolt would continue for another four years. And in this time, the Persians uh, mounted campaigns where they would take areas back under control. Uh, this would culminate in what's known as the Battle of Lade, which was a naval battle just off the coast of uh, Miletus. Um, and the Greeks were soundly defeated there, mainly through some treachery, and which was the Persian preferred tactic when engaging in battles, was to try and undermine their their opponent. Uh, this basically spelled the end of the revolt, effectively, it's just mopping up operations left. But Darius I, he would not forget the Athenians. And to make sure of this, he had one of his servants, every time he sat down to dinner, would whisper in his ear three times, Master, remember the Athenians. And remember the Athenians he did. This would um, result in the first Persian invasion. Um, to prepare for this, Darius had um, emissaries sent all through Greece and all through the Greek islands. And the aim with these emissaries was to have everyone submit to Persian rule. Uh, it was known of seeking earth and water. So the, the city would provide earth and water from their city and it would be taken back to the Persian empire as a token of submission. Uh, the Greeks would call this Medizing. Uh, it was another, uh, Medes was another uh, name that they would call the Persians, as well as uh, Barbarois, Barbarian. 
Um, the first campaign that Darius would launch was in 492 BC. And this campaign would travel through Thrace, through the north. Um, this campaign didn't last too long. Um, it was sent out with an, an army and a navy. Uh, the navy, as it tried to round Mount Athos, was caught in a storm and much of it destroyed. While in Thrace, uh, the commander Mardonius, he was wounded and he had to contend with a lot of ambushes from Thracian tribes. And eventually they returned back into the empire. Uh, it's also interesting to note that Darius would not accompany any of these campaigns, which has led some to wonder what the uh, motivation or the end result of this invasion was. Was it just to gain revenge or to gain control of Greece? Um, the next campaign would take place two years later. Uh, this time it would be somewhat of an island hopping campaign through the Aegean. Um, the troops would be loaded on ships and sent through the Aegean, stopping off on the islands, uh, bringing them into the empire and those islands that had assisted in the Ionian revolt where uh, vengeance had been taken upon them. Uh, once they had arrived, they, their first port of call once reaching uh, Greece was Eretria, where they sacked the city and sent all the citizens back into the Persian Empire as slaves. After their, um, their success there, they then rounded Attica and, head to, and made their way to the Bay of Marathon. Now, while this was happening, the Athenians were preparing to march onto uh, Marathon, but they also sent a runner to Sparta to seek some aid. Um, unfortunately, Sparta was in the middle of a religious festival, the Carnea, and advised that they would not be able to march to war until the next full moon. So returning back to uh, Marathon, the Athenian army with their ally, uh, the Plataeans, engaged and they actually defeated the Persians at Marathon. Though the Spartans weren't just uh, trying to get out of uh, engaging in battle, they arrived on the battlefield the next day. So it appears that they had been um, amassing on the borders and as soon as the full moon had, had hit, they marched straight to Marathon, but arriving a day late. Uh, effectively, this saw the first Persian invasion stopped and um, everyone went home. But this would not be but this would not be the uh, last attempt that they would uh, try. It would be another 10 years before the next campaign was launched, but so why was it so long between them? Well, the Persian king Darius I, he, he passed away from an illness during this period, and his son Xerxes came to the throne. And usually when a uh, new king comes to a throne in an empire, revolts break out. So he had to deal with um, a revolt in Babylon and in Egypt. But once these were taken care of, he then shifted his focus back, back west. Um, he then sought about uh, gathering resources from all over the Persian empire. Um, we, in Herodotus' account, he lists uh, what's uh, I guess it's similar to what's found in Homer's uh, Iliad, like the catalogue of ships, where he runs through all the different um, nations that made up the army. Uh, this time around too, the army would be about 10 times the size of what landed at Marathon. Now, the ancient sources through Herodotus say that his army was over 2 million strong, but modern day sources put it at just over 200,000 strong. Uh, it's thought, the theory is that Herodotus or one of the sources he got the information from confused the commanders of uh, that commanded the 1,000 troops and 10,000 troops. So if we strike a zero from the 2 million, we get 200,000. That's the theory anyway. Um, but before his army could march, um, the way ahead was prepared. They had supply dumps prepared all along. Well, the army was going to take the same route that the first campaign had taken through Thrace, Macedonia, and into the north of Greece. Um, supply dumps were set up all along this path in the years leading up to it. But also, there were a number of engineering projects underway. Now, the first one... ..was the Hellespont, bridging the Hellespont. Um, it was roughly two kilometres wide that had to be bridged. And it was made up um, of 
Well, it was two bridges and they were made up of just over 300 ships in each bridge. Um, there was a, like a road base put down. Um, they were tied together through cables and uh, netting put up so that the pack animals wouldn't um, be frightened from the rushing water underneath them. Um, the other engineering project was bridging the River Strymon up in Thrace. And the third, which has, was disbelieved to have occurred, oops, sorry, was the canal through Mount Athos. So they wanted to avoid that disaster that happened in the first campaign. And Xerxes had a canal cut through the peninsula at Mount Athos. Uh, this would allow his ships to avoid having to round the tip of Mount Athos. And, and apparently it's notorious for storms whipping up in that location. Um, and actually being disbelieved for only, I think a couple of decades ago, um, there was some geo surveying done in the area and they actually found that there was an ancient canal that had been dug through that peninsula. Anyway, um, so in, in April, um, Xerxes had been gathering his forces in Sardis and in, in, in the north, and they then set out to march towards the Hellespont. Uh, the army then crossed the Hellespont in early June, and supposedly it took the entire army a whole week to cross over the bridges into Europe. And then it would take them nearly three months to travel the rest of the distance before they arrived outside of Thermopylae in early August, mid-August. Though the Greeks, they weren't idle during this period either. They were preparing. They knew an invasion was coming. Um, most notably, the Greeks held what's known as the Conference of Corinth, where all the Greeks that were uh, looking to defend uh, the, Greek, the Greek mainland would meet to um, arrange uh, preparations for the defence. Now, it's interesting to note that there's roughly about 700 city-states that would have been affected by this invasion. And in the end, only th around 32 city-states would come to form what's known as the Hellenic League that were committed to the defence of Greece. So uh, there were a series of, um, of meetings and it's not entirely clear what was discussed at each one, but we hear that the quarrels that the Greeks had were put to rest. Um, the Greeks were at war, well, the different Greek city-states were at war with each other more than they were with um, foreigners. So all of those were put aside so they could focus on uh, the greater threat of Persia. Uh, they all pledged loyalty to each other um, for the duration of the campaign until Persia was defeated. They also arranged for uh, three spies to be sent over into over to Sardis to gather information on the army that was assembling. Uh, these spies were actually caught when they were in Sardis and they were brought before Xerxes. And instead of having them executed, he took them on a tour of the entire army uh, so that they could then return back to Greece and report on the vast size that the vast size of the army that was coming to bear down on them, trying to uh, submit them through fear. Um, they also attempted to gain more allies. Uh, the largest of these was uh, Galon of Syracuse. Uh, he had an extremely large navy. And if they could have secured his, his help, that would have almost doubled the size of the Greek fleet. Uh, we're told that these talks broke down, mainly due to the fact that the Greeks were not prepared to give Galon uh, command of the forces. Though it appears Galon would go on to actually fight a campaign against the Carthaginians, and uh, people have wondered whether Xerxes was in communication with the Carthaginians to... Uh, prevent him from aiding the Greeks in their cause. Um, initially, the defence was decided to, well, they were trying to mount the defence as far north as possible, and a site at Mount Olympus, at Mount, at, uh, a pass at Tempe, was decided to send forces to. Now, once the forces got here, they quickly discovered that this was just, their position was untenable. They, there were so many other passes that would outflank their position so they returned it back and new discussions had to be made. And what they came up with was a defence line at Thermopylae and Artemisium. Now, Thermopylae would be a choke point. This would almost neutralise the Persian numbers and also their strongest arm, the cavalry. 
and the site of Artemisium was where the Greek fleet would be sent to. And this was to prevent the Persian fleet that would be sailing down of outflanking the position at Thermopylae. Now, there was the Olympic festival was taking place at this time, and so was the Carnea. But Sparta had arranged that they would be sending 300 hoplites, and commanding these hoplites would be Leonidas, the Spartan commander. Also, um, a Spartan commander would be in charge of the navy. Um, it, that's another thing that had been decided upon where since a majority of the uh, Hellenic League were Peloponnesians and Sparta was the most influential, they had decided that Spartans would be commanding these. Leonidas was one of the kings um, and Eurybiades who commanded the navy was not a king, but by this stage it was customary for one of the kings to remain back in Sparta. But as Hollywood would like you to believe, it wasn't just 300 hoplites that were going. There were another 4,000 uh, Peloponnesians that would be marching. Um, and probably of these were about 1,000 other um, Lacedaemonians, perhaps Perioiki, the um, not full uh, Spartan citizens, but they, they were uh, free. And also the helots, the Spartan slave class, would have uh, also accompanied the Spartans. It's not known how many of these were, uh, were accompanying the army. And, but also at the pass, once the uh, Peloponnesians had arrived at Thermopylae, they were met there by another 3,000 other Greeks. Uh, Phocaeans, the Thespians, um, were large contingents there as well. Um, Athens was not present with the army. They had put all their resources into the navy and they were um, the, the greater majority of the navy. Uh, Sparta did have five ships with the navy. Uh, seems maybe more of a, a token force since they had a commander there as well. So the Greeks had marched to Thermopylae. Now at Thermopylae, and this, here's some images here. This is what, what we see today. But the landscape that they would have seen would have been quite a bit different to this. In the, on the picture on the left here, we can see the hills and a large flat area and uh, the sea, the, the gulf that comes in. Uh, this part of the gulf would have come all the way up to uh, the base of the mountains here in ancient times. So effectively, it was a pass. It was a uh, thin road that went around the, through the mountains and had the sea on one side. And again, you see on the, the right here, you can imagine the water coming up beyond this road here. Uh, within the within the pass, there was what's known as three gates, and these were basically choke points. It's where the mountain came right down to the um, to the land, and made a uh, extremely narrow pass. Um, we're told that at one of these, it was barely wide enough for two carts to pass each other. Also, in the region was a, an old wall which was used through uh, earlier conflicts and. Uh, Leonidas had that repaired to use in there when they would mount their defence. And it's also when they arrived here that he learned from the locals that there was a trail that led through the mountains. Uh, this wasn't a pass where you could leave a large army, but it was more of a, a goat trail. Uh, so his response for this was to send the um, Phocians up into the mountains. Um, they were more, well, they knew, the, they knew the area a lot more than everyone else. And there was about a thousand of them and their objective was to defend that trail. Um, while this was happening, the Persians had been assembling outside, outside of Thermopylae. And we hear a tale of a Persian, uh, one of the Persian scouts coming up to the Greek position to, so he could report back on their numbers. And we hear an exchange um, he had with Leonidas. Supposedly, he came with a message from Xerxes that the Greeks were to lay down their arms. And this is where we get the, the famous saying, one on Labe, where Le, Le, uh, Leonidas came back with, come and take them. Anyway, the Persians, they waited for, they didn't attack straight away. They waited for four days. Um, Xerxes was thinking that their vast numbers, surely the Greeks would melt away. Um, why, would, why would such a small force stand in his way? But the Greeks would not melt away. And eventually Xerxes became frustrated and sent forces in. 
Now, his initial goal was to capture the Greeks in the past. He wanted to catch them, bring them before him and ask, why, why do you stand before me? What? But as they approached to uh, try and capture the, the Greeks in the past, they were met with a wall of bronze and with bristling sp um, spears. Um, in this, they suffered heavy, casu heavy casualties and Xerxes kept reinforcing the, the attack and sent more troops in uh, against the uh, against the Greeks in the pass. But these again, they suffered the same fate. They just took heavy casualties. Eventually, he thought enough of this and he gathered his elite troops known as the Immortals. Um, this was a force that was 10,000 strong and the Greeks tell us that they would never fall below this number. If they suffered casualties, there were always more to replenish the ranks. So the Immortals were sent in, and but they fared no better. They suffered heavy casualties once again as well. We also hear that on this first day, it appears that Sparta was the only contingent holding the pass at this stage. And to, to uh, inflict these heavy casualties, they resorted to a tactic um, being such a, well, being raised in a militaristic society. Um, they were very uh, good with tactics and very disciplined. What they would do is as the Persians approached, they would feign retreat back into the pass. And the Persians thinking that they had them on the run would break ranks and chase after them. And the Spartans would then turn around, form back up and be able to cut down the disorganized Persian units. And this was done over and over throughout the day. Eventually, Xerxes recalled his forces, and that was day one. The uh, Greeks still held the pass. On the second day, uh, Xerxes had seen his forces had suffered quite a number of casualties, and this led him to assume that the Greeks must be a spent force also. Surely, if he had suffered so many casualties, the Greeks would have um, would be in no, in no um, form to fight now. Though he sent more troops in and they would suffer a similar fate this day. Uh, on this day, uh, Leonidas, he arranged for the Greeks to fight in what's known as in relays. He would have every contingent take a turn in the front ranks. Uh, this allowed for fresh troops to always be cycling through and dealing with the Persians as they came on. And once again, this would, they would hold the pass on the second day. So by this stage, Xerxes was becoming very frustrated. Surely his monumental force should be able to brush aside these Greeks. So he, he sent word out, he would have been sending word out earlier about um, any other ways to get around the Greeks. And eventually, well, what history has recorded is a man named Ephialtes, that Greek nightmare. And he would come forward and betray the Greek position. He would tell Xerxes of the trail, the goat track that led through the hills, and it would be able to bring them down behind the Spartan position. Now, it's thought that uh, Ephialtes, I mean, he's been recorded as the villain, but it's thought that there could be a number of people that could uh, take, take this role. Though um, history has recorded the Spartans of putting out a bounty on his head at the end of the Greek and Persian Wars, and he was executed for this crime. So Xerxes arranged for the immortals to be sent up on the trail. Um, we're not told exactly how many, but it must have been a considerable number since there was a thousand Greeks up on those hills defending the pass. Um, the Greeks, they, well, the immortals were actually uh, surprised to see Greeks up there and uh, attack them with arrows. Uh, Phacaeans thinking that they were the main point of the, of the attack retreated up, and up to a higher ground and prepared to defend themselves. Though the immortals would hold, be able to hold them in place and bypass their position. Now, during uh, the early morning, uh, Leonidas learned of the Persian movements, and he had lookouts confirm that the that the Phacaeans had been out had been outmaneuvered. Um, he held a council, and a lot of the Greek contingents wanted to just flee, and many did. Uh, a number did um, vote to stay behind and defend the pass. In the end, Leonidas decided to send everyone away, but decided he and his 300 would remain, as well as the, whatever helots they had with them. Um, the Thespians, they were 700 strong. They denied to leave. They said they would be staying as well. And we also told the Thebans that Thebans had a force 
I think of about 400. And we're told that they were forced to stay, but that's not entirely clear. I mean, um, this comes down to a lot of what's been reported later on with um, politics a couple of generations later. But uh, Thebes had supposedly medized, but it's thought that these Thebans may have been of the opposing faction in Thebes. Um, so now, with the knowledge that uh, they had the uh, Persian immortals coming down behind them and the Persians in front, Greeks now assembled and decided they would be advancing out from the pass and fighting in more open ground. And this battle would take on, uh, I guess, a, an air more like the Bronze Age uh, battles of old, uh, with men seeking out their opponents. Now, we're told during this battle, uh, the, the Spartans' the spears had broken, they were fighting with their swords now. And, and it's at this time that Leonidas falls and was killed. Now, the Spartans tried to protect his body and beat off four different Persian attacks to where they were able to recover Leonidas. And due to their heavy casualties, they all started falling back, back into the pass. And this is where they would uh, mount their final stand. Um, so the Greeks, well, sorry, the uh, Spartans, they formed up onto a, a small hill and we're told that the Thespians also found a small hill and they formed up. And it's reported that the Thebans at their first opportunity were uh, ran over surrendering to the Persians. But again, we're not sure how accurate that is. Um, and here, the final stand was mounted. Uh, the Persians came on and a great melee happened. And we're just, we're told of the Greeks fighting with their hands and teeth. Eventually, Xerxes, seeing enough casualties mounting on his side, called his forces back. And now that the uh, immortals had come down behind the Greeks, all the archers were sent forward. Now, it's um, earlier in the battle, we hear of uh, one of the Spartan soldiers being told of the, uh, that the Persian archers were so numerous that when they fired their arrows, they would blot out the sun. And he responded, good, then we shall have our battle in the shade. And it's at this stage that the archers let their arrows go, raining down on the Spartans and the Thespians and completely wiped them out. So all the Greeks that were in the pass had either fled or were laying dead. Um, Xerxes now had his troops scour through all the bodies and wanted to recover Leonidas's body. Uh, once it was found, he had Leonidas's head cut off and put up on a stake for the rest of his army to see. So the position at Thermopylae had now fallen. And what happened now was there was a scout, well, there was a scout ship off the coast of Thermopylae, which was to report back to Artemisium on the goings on there. Um, at Artemisium, the fleet had been engaging in three days of battle also, and they were um, discussing whether to pull back also. Um, once the scout ship arrived with the news of the, um, the Greek defence in the pass falling, they then decided to withdraw at once. So now the path into Greece was open. Uh, the Persian army, uh, would start mar marching through the pass into Boeotia and into Attica, and the fleet would then make its way down the coast as well. Uh, eventually, the um, Persian army made their way onto Athens, captured the Acropolis, and burnt it to the ground. It's at here that one of the uh, first, first Greek victories would occur, or major victories would occur, at the Battle of Salamis. And this was a naval engagement. After um, Finally uniting, uh, they fought a, a great naval battle at Salamis and were able to defeat the Persian navy. Uh, this would be instrumental into, in stopping the second Persian invasion. As now, the Persian navy was, in effect, uh, unusable. It suffered too many losses. It had been sent back to guard um, the Anatolian coast. Though um, Xerxes, he would head back home with a, a large portion of his army, but uh, Mardonius would remain with a large Persian force and they would stay in Greece for another year. Um, and eventually, the largest battle of the war would take place. And this was at Plataea, where I think it's the, the largest uh, known Greek force at this stage had assembled to take on the Persians. And here they were able to defeat the Persians resoundingly. And this 
and as well as there was another battle, the Battle of Mycale, which was on the Anatolian coast. Uh, the, the Greek Navy had been sent out and engaged the Persian Navy over there. And interestingly enough, the naval battle turned into a land battle with everyone dismounting on land. And with these two victories, this essentially saw the second invasion stopped. So the legacy of Thermopylae would cement Sparta's reputation. Um, all the, all the um, sayings, everything we associate with Sparta, this seems to be a tangible point in history where we can point to that shows their unwillingness to retreat in battle, um, to do their duty. Uh, it wasn't about the individual, it was about, it was about the state. And eventually, uh, leading up to the Battle of Plataea, there was a, a rallying cry. Remember Thermopylae, it would become a rallying, a rallying cry that would unite the Greeks. And it can be found, a lot of the sentiments can be found in the Oath of Plataea, uh, of doing, doing one's duty, not retreating. Um, and I feel a lot of this has really come from what, what happened at Thermopylae and the sacrifice that was made there. So why do we remember Thermopylae? It was a defeat. The Greeks had uh, larger battles, they had great victories, but most people, when you ask about a, a Greek battle, they would name Thermopylae or the Battle of the 300. Well, I think it's very similar to a concept I guess we have in, in Australia. Most people remember the campaign of Gallipoli and it's not so much the result of the battle, it's what it would come to represent. It would be the sacrifice, the mateship, uh, the not retreating, doing one's duty. And this is, and over time, this is what become more important than the actual result of the battle. And it would come to be a rallying cry for, for later battles and used as an example. So at the site of, um, of uh, Thermopylae, there's a number of monuments. Um, obviously the most, one of the most well-known is the, the Onidas monument, um, signifying the sacrifice that the 300 Spartans made there. Also, there is recently been made a thespian monument to um, remember the 700 thespians that also fell in the pass. Um, and another one is Simonides' epitaph. Now, this was set up in ancient times. Um, there's a more recent um, stone that's been set up with the engraving. And that's the famous ones it says, go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here obedient to their laws, we lie. So I think with the Greeks having perished at Thermopylae, especially the Spartans, we can perhaps see them as winning their, as winning their Kleos, that immortal glory that the warriors of Homer's Iliad sought. As 2,500 years on, they have been remembered and celebrated throughout the ages. Thank you so much for that interesting and really engaging uh, lecture, Mark. Uh, nice. I can see why you're a podcaster. You are you you have the perfect voice for it, and you have the knowledge to back it as well. So thank you so much. No problem, um, Titus. You are, um, as we say in Greek, a Phil Um a lover of a friend of the Greeks. So thank you so much. Yes, I feel um, a little bit out of place. The the non-Greek talking to the Greeks. Oh uh, well. <laughs> Non-Greeks have always uh, been there for Greece from the, <laughs> from the revolution from 1821 till now. So thank you so much. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, now is your time to put them in the chat and I'll ask Mark. Um, I have a question for you either way, Mark. Yep. Um, you mentioned at the start of your presentation that Herodotus is the most complete um, source on the Greco-Persian Wars. 
Um, do you also feel that he is um, the most impartial or just complete? What's your opinion on Herodotus so far? Um, I think he definitely for narr narrative sense, he gives the most complete account of what was taking place. Um, I guess uh, there's a few aspects where you could question him on, like I, I, I wonder about the, the Theban uh, side of things. And obviously the, the numbers um, for the, the Persians that were invading can be disputed. And I think have it's sort of overwhelmingly decided that they, they were far too high. But again, I could give him the benefit of the doubt that he had received um, information that had been garbled as well. Um, but for the main part, I think a lot of what he does say, um, we can look at it um, with, uh, with, a, with a sensible lens and sort of work out perhaps what, what might have been going on. I don't think he set out to represent anyone uh, the wrong way. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I agree so far. In my reading of Herodotus, I'd, I'd say so as well. Um, I feel like Thucydides is sometimes less impartial. Um, just the first question is from Theone. Um, what do the Persian sources say about the Battle of Thermopylae that you know of? So as far as I'm aware, there are no real Persian sources. Um, everything in the Persian Empire exists through monuments and tablets, and they weren't in the business of talking about any defeats that they suffered. Uh, any, anything that they would bring up would be um, talking about how victorious the king was or how successful he was. Um, I'm not aware of anything that talks about Thermopylae itself. Uh, if there was, I dare say it would be in favour of the Persians, somehow. Um, the next question is from Nicol. Hello, Mark. Thank you for your amazing webinar. I have a question for you. You mentioned the Spartans usually kept one king at home while one was in the field. Uh, why was that, do you think? Um, there's, uh, I think, um, I'm trying to remember what year it was, but it would have been a, a decade or so earlier. Um, the Spartans had campaigned together and quarrels had broken out. Um, and this was, I think the most recent one was through uh, Cleomenes and Demaratus, um, which saw a breakdown in their, their command and uh, the command, interestingly, they were marching on Athens, but the uh, command broke down and the campaign petered out. Um, also, I guess if we look at it a bit closer, if a king fell in battle, you, well, you wouldn't want both kings to fall in battle at the same time. So you wanted a king back home. And I think this was discovered after uh, some events earlier on. Mm, very right. That's very true. Um, the next question is from Andrew. Hi, Mark. Did Xerxes play any strategic role or was it just Mydonius, his general? So for the actual campaign, oh, for the second invasion, uh, Xerxes was the overall leader. We hear of him being approached. Um, it's assumed that anyone that would have approached the Persian army, such as the Ephialtes, it would have been um, through the commanders. Uh, it seems very unlikely that someone would be brought before the king. Um, eventually, Mardonius was put in command when Xerxes left after, um, after the failure at uh, Salamis. And then he was, well, I guess, well, Mardonius was in, in command. Um, it's, it's hard to say strategically who was doing what, um, since our Greek sources always refer to Xerxes as, as making the decisions or... I think on the ground, you could probably say it was the commander who was there at the spot. But for those long-term decisions, um, Xerxes would have been consulted through messengers as it would have been, it would have been some lag time to getting messengers back and forward. Mm. Um, and uh, for anybody who hasn't uh, already checked out Mark's uh, fabulous podcast, Casting for Ancient Greece, um, you can find it as the co-host uh, to this lecture, uh, the event on Facebook, and we'll be sharing the uh, links to his website and Facebook page on our um, social media. Um, just another question, Mark, um, this time from Alexander. Hi, Mark, that was great. Um, post second invasion, how long did the Hellenic states remain united? Um, 
Well, this is the period where we start to see the comings on of the Athenian Empire, mm. where we get um, a Delian League set up, and it, um, they were basically trying to, to mount a coalition that would uh, prevent a third Persian invasion from taking place. And this is this period is where we see a lot of the precursors to the Peloponnesian War breaking out. So I, I think it was almost straight away that um, quarrels returned and you started having uh, camps forming on one, one side or the other. Mm. Um, that's, yeah, that's 100% correct with the, you know, the lead up to the Peloponnesian War as well when it would all fall apart again. Um, just another question that I've always found uh, fascinating. Um, after the body of uh, Leonidas was mutilated, um, do we know of any similar mutilation by the Persians against the Greeks throughout the conflict, or was it just Leonidas? Um, so this is one, this was actually quite uncommon for a uh, practice for the Persians to take. Mm. Um, they usually treated rulers that they captured or killed with great respect. And um, again, how far um, poetic license has been taken with this, I'm not, we're not too sure, but um, it was uncommon for the Persians to actually desecrate a, a, a monarch of another nation. They would actually give them funerary honours. Um, if they were captured alive, they would be incorporated into the Persian court and, and treated properly. So mm. whether this was just Xerxes' frustrations at the Greeks in the past, being held, he ended up being held up for um, uh, seven days there. Um, or, yeah, it's hard, hard to tell for sure. Yeah, it is hard to tell. Um, the power of retrospect. But um, there's a question on the Facebook um, from Stacy. Um, good evening, Mark. What out outcome do you feel um, would have occurred had the complete Spartan army attended the battle? Um, again, if this was in the pass, it was outflanked. I mean, it would be hard to see a force if they were in the same position um, with a surrounded surviving for too long. Um, eventually, they'd, they'd be cut off some supplies. Um, they may have put up a, a stronger fight, um, lasted much longer. But I think in that same position, um, ultimately, we see the same, probably the same um, outcome and probably even more catastrophic in the end. Though, um, I guess when you look at, when you think about it, uh, Plataea is when the Greeks actually came out in a stronger force. The Spartans had arrived in probably the largest body of troops that they had before and on the open ground um, or with some protective terrain, uh, united with other Greeks, they were able to actually defeat the Persians. But I think at the site of Thermopylae, um, it would have, if, if anything, drawn out, but probably much the same result. Mm. Um, I think that's a perfect answer. Um, Right, well, it's almost uh, seven um, here in Melbourne, um, and we'll begin to wind up the, the lecture. Um, I think that you've made a lot of fans, Mark, of your podcast here tonight. Um, cool. I know that I'll be uh, tuning in as much as I can. Uh, again, we'll be uploading and sharing all of your social media um, links on our page. If I could uh, just quickly add in there. Yeah, sure. Um, if people are interested in this battle, I'm actually in the series approaching this top, this topic now. And so if you want to get uh, much more information and, and go into it much more in depth, uh, that's where we are at the series now. We're actually, next episode is going to be on the Ionian Revolt. Perfect. Well, that's, that's a, this is an excellent segue then um, into your podcast. Um, uh, we've got a question just before we finish up from Theo. Um, what platform uh, are the podcasts on? Where are you recording them? Um, so on my website, www.castingthroughancientgreece.com, um, I put everything up there. I put additional information and resources. Or otherwise, any, any podcasting platform, you can find it there. Um, and you can jump onto Facebook and uh, Twitter. Is all, I've got accounts there. 
and I, I basically share all my uh, episode links on there. So it's quite easy to, to find them. Um, I think uh, uh, I know that uh, in Theo, you'll find uh, an avid watcher as well. I know that he'll love your podcast. Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you to everybody for attending. Um, thank you to everybody who's been watching on the Facebook live stream as well. Um, and we'll be finishing up the uh, Zoom meeting now. Thank you to everybody for attending. Nice. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mark.